Live. Okay, hello everyone. We are continuing our adventures in multi-computation, looking at uh, figuring out how to kind of crispen up the idea of multi-computation so that uh, we can understand it in a Wolfram language context. And I think Nick has a demo here. So maybe you should go ahead, Nick, and uh, share and show your demo. Sure. So, well, f first I want to continue from last time, uh, discussing find path, lazy versions of it, mm -hmm. because I made some adjustments to it. So it's basically the same thing as above. You can, you can, as last time, you can construct a lazy nest tree essentially, and then well, hold on, hold on, hold on. We, last time we had a detailed discussion about what how all these functions should work. So can can you remind us? And is is this as implemented as we discussed? Well, we have a abstracted it to a compute uh, additional computational object as we discussed. So finding okay, th that nest lazy thing is that what we discussed or not? This is some kind of data structure. So wait a minute. What did we discuss last time about this? We discussed that we have a, a lazy data structure and the computation lazy computation data structure object. So lazy object as the data structure and the lazy computation object as a, two different things. Okay, but what is this? This is object. It is still unformatted. So the, what, what is the function the nest lazy? I, I thought we had discussed doing this in a different way. I thought we had discussed not doing this and instead having it be the case that you start off with a lazy list and most things are constructed because there is a lazy list then. And maybe nest was right. an exception as subsets is an exception and so on. So what are the exceptions? Well, the right. question is, what are the initial constructors of lazy lists? Yeah, that's that right. That's what I'm asking. Yes. Well, initial, well, we have lazy range. We have lazy subsets. Okay, but, but this is what we discussed last time with some specificity. We need to kind of follow up on what we did last time and make sure we're not going backwards, right? So last time, can, can uh, Kristen, can you remind us, please, what, what specifically did we conclude last time? So the lists from last time are included in that agenda. Right. But but I think that we didn't, I mean, I, I I think that things like nest and range and so on, we we left those as separate functions. It was yes, only I agree. Really, so it's lazy you know, range, lazy nest, right? Yeah. Is that correct? Except it wasn't nest lazy, it was lazy nest, was it not? Well, maybe lazy nest list, because that's what that would what generate an actual list. Okay, but, but let's be specific because we, we're, we're, we're trying to actually nail this down. So we we because we don't want to just keep meeting and keep saying the same thing, so to speak. So let's let's be specific. Let's look at last week's agenda. Lazy um, nest list was a potential lazy variant from last week. Okay, so which what are the other functions which were the potential lazy variants? Lazy range, lazy table, lazy array, lazy constant array, lazy tuples, lazy okay. subset. Okay, all right, all right, all right. So this is what we need implemented, Nick. I mean, and not something different, but we well, specifically I, I what we had designed. I get it. There are a bunch of functions that are essentially just a lazy variants of list generation. I, I, I know, I know, I know. But let's see those so that we can actually start writing code with them and see how well it works. Uh, okay, okay. We'll just skip this thing because I have. No, no. Maybe you want to. No, no let's look at lazy find path now. Okay, so so you've got. I'll ignore the fact that that we didn't get these things, but we really need these things. Okay, so this should have been lazy. What, what is this? What would this be in our in our new list of constructors? Well, I'm not, not sure. It's kind of... Okay, but that's what we have to figure well, out. Wait, so right? Sorry, what, what is lazy find path? Is it like find path or is it something else? And then does it have an analog with non-lazy? It uses in the tree. It, it uses in this kind of tree which is like a forest maybe you can call it a forest because you have a list of trees and it searches a yeah, value. let's be specific because this, this is the nest this is the lazy nest tree object not the lazy list object or like sorry it's the lazy tree object instead of the lazy list object and so this is an operation for finding paths and lazy tree objects say it again 
I can't tell us. Sorry, okay, I, okay. I, I just meant to say that, that, I mean, basically we have a bunch of operations like lazy range, lazy nest list, et cetera, which are for lazy lists. But yeah. it seems like this, this, uh, this here is an operation on a lazy tree, which is a different thing. And basically, it's just finding a path down the tree, right? Yeah, okay, this let, is, let, let, I, lazy itself is a generating a tree. Lazy okay, find but, but, a so this isn't what we discussed last time. Okay, so what we need to make sure of, and Kristen, you need to make sure of this, is that by next time we meet, we actually have implementations of the actual functions we discussed. Right, not different functions, but the actual functions we discussed. Because then we're going to use those to actually try and write code and see how well it works. Right, we can't do it unless we, if, if it's just like, well, you could in principle write those functions. Um, you know, that's one thing, but that's not what we want. What we want is to actually write them so we can actually use them. Am I making sense? I mean, we could write them right now. If we can't get them written any other way, I'll write them. I mean, you know, this is, we need to write these particular functions, not different functions, but these particular functions. Does Nick, does that make sense? Is there some problem? With it? Well, I wrote some of them, just not all of them. Okay, see. but let's make sure we have all of them. What we discussed last time, I think, was to have a guide page, right? Did we did that get built, Kristen? We don't have a full guide page yet, no. Well, the, the you have even part of a guide right. page. We have the guide page that Nick has been creating with the packlet. Okay, so Nick, Kristen, your responsibility for next time is to make sure we have a guide page that has all these functions listed and as many of them as possible actually implemented. Okay. Okay, now, where is nest lazy, which isn't on that? What, what was that in the discussion in the functions that we had defined last time? Was, is this a new and different function that we had not defined last time, or is this a function we defined last time? We've seen it I, last, last time. No, no, no. It, was it in the list of functions that we said we were going to implement last time? And if so, what was its name? No, it wasn't. So, well, I, I think this is the one that we, I, I remember Ian had a bunch of stuff where he was saying that that they, for XML stuff, they were also doing kind of lazy trees like this. And so there, it seemed like there were several different people doing lazy tree stuff like okay, this. Okay, is, is Ian with us here it. today? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, can you speak to that? Well, so Treefold originally had a lazy variant and we haven't tackled laziness directly in the project yet, but we need it for things like file browser type explorers for trees and for streaming transformations. Right. He discussed that last time, but tree fold is not the only. So, I mean, are you imagining, because because we talked before about streams and streams as a source of laziness, right? Yep. And so are you imagining a tree fold where the list that is in the tree fold is a stream? Is that what you imagine? No, it, it's more the idea of um, being able to do um, conversions between different kinds of tree structures like XML and JSON without having to construct the intermediate tree. Okay, well, let's look at that, but that's a different thing, I think. And just like, again, it's, it's really important in these meetings that we actually follow through. We define what functions we're going to implement, then we implement them, not we go off in a different direction because otherwise we'll, it, this will never converge. And we really, you know, we're cl pretty close, I think, here. And I think we really need to get it to converge. Okay, so... We have a direction. The direction is connected to multi-computation, right? Yes. Just, so we have nest lazy. That's a data structure. Find path generates a computational object that traverses the data structure. And I was mostly spending time since last time implementing actual part and matcher. That is lazy. Okay. Well, okay. So we can look at that, but let, let's, I just want to make sure that the design that we have here, how does it relate to the design that we've had before to this nest lazy thing? Well, nest what lazy is it? I haven't changed the, the no, change. No, but what, what, what is, what was the best version of the design of this that we got to? Well, I'm sure that the, the, the only thing that we mentioned is that there should be a separate computation object that you can use. Right. Right. But how are you generating the computation object? So you're saying that First we make a generator that is like an infinite lazy object that you can. Okay. Calculate. So what, what is that generator in this case? In this case, it's generated by function. It's a nice lazy thing. It okay. Can also so be, but let's decide what that function so, actually should be because that isn't the function. 
Right. So this is the last time this came up. The reason I brought up the, the Ian thing is the last time this came up, we started talking about different designs for constructors, but then it became clear that 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 you know, at least with trees, that there was at least some tentative stuff that was gonna happen at some point that was gonna have its own constructors for this. And so then we sort of stopped talking about it. Okay, fine. But then this is ultimately I don't understand this syntax at all, right? Because to me, if I read this, this is a nest. The, the, this, you know, the non-lazy version of this is just a nest. And you're imagining there's an infinity in the third argument of the nest. Is that correct? It's basically, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's like a nest, it's nest tree. tree. It's, it's a nest multi tree, not nest. Multi-way generating thing. Okay, but, but hold on, hold on. What's the, what's the non-lazy version of this? If I only go two levels, what's the non-lazy version? Is it nest tree? It's a nest tree. Okay, can you type it? Because it would just be... Wait a minute, comma three. Okay, all right, okay, all right. So that's what we're looking at. So then you want a lazy nest tree, basically, in which mm -hmm. so it will be lazy nest. I mean, in the current name nomenclature, in the current naming convention, this would simply be lazy nest tree. Is that correct? Yes, or oh, ne nest tree lazy or something. Well, no. Why is it that? Because if it's lazy range, it should be lazy nest tree. Do, do, do you see what I'm saying? If we're going to call it lazy range, which we may not, we right. may have a different name for it. I was thinking... Te technically, this is actually a collision of different naming conventions because the nest family is always nest and then the object it produces. So it could be nest lazy tree, but that's too bizarre. Well, what is lazy tree? That's the thing this returns, right? And we have lazy. What well, does it? I thought it was a lazy computation. It. Well, whatever you. Or want is it? Or is it a lazy it. tree, but which is also what Ian is producing? Okay, let me let me make a comment about names. Okay, what about the possibility? Since these things are not themselves the structures, they are makers of the structure. What about the possibility of instead of lazy list, something like list maker? But, but we don't have, I mean, everywhere else in the system, if you're constructing a blah, the head, you know, you just use the head for it. I mean, you don't use list maker returning a list object. No, I'm imagining well. Or okay, rule so. maker returning a rule object or something. It's very object oriented programming like. No, no, but but I mean the point is that. Okay, what does lazy list return? Actually, lazy list, sorry. What does lazy table return? Do you have a lazy table, Nick? Yeah, well, it returns uh, some kind of cons. But, but, but it returns a lazy see. list, fundamentally. I mean, it let's doesn't see. matter what the implementation of the lazy list is. It returns a lazy list. Okay, so that thing... All right, so we need one structure, which is that lazy, as we've talked about last time, we need the kind of uh, sort of space-like hypersurface version of this, which is, oh, wait a minute. We're, we're, I mean, none of these are multi. This is just a lazy object. I'm now confused. There's a lazy object that is a single object, like a list. Should that be distinguished from a lazy object? No, that, that, I'm sorry, I'm getting myself confused. There's just a single lazy. What, lazy what lists of... and lazy trees are different things, or at least they should be. Their All semantics right, so... are different. They represent different kinds of data. The functions that work on them are different. Okay, yeah. fine. So can we please write down at the top of this notebook, uh, at the top of the notebook, let's write down, because I don't want we us to get confused by this again. What are the actual objects we're dealing with? It's lazy list. As an object. Yes, as an object. And words, it's... it's cons, cons list. What are those? What are those? No. What are those? Well, those are the right. actual constructors, not the generators that we use, the actual head. Well, of the well I mean, but I think the idea is that, I mean, I think you can internally, it can do something like cons list, or it could do, I mean, again, there's stuff like when you had Leonid here, you know, the streaming stuff or, or whatever the implementation is. But the head of the, the actual object that you see get returned should probably just be lazy list. 
inside of it, it can have a bunch of con stuff, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's nice, but it's not what we should have at the top level. So you should remove that. That's the infrastructure underneath the lazy list. So you can make a separate section there called infrastructure or something, a subsection of objects, which will probably not even be documented. And then there's the actual top level objects. Okay, so that is lazy list, right? It's the first one. The next one is lazy tree, presumably. But it is, is it going to be like an abstraction or just a, a wrap around the infrastructure? It's a wrapper around the infrastructure. Okay. Well, you, you might, yeah, yeah. But as far as functions and users are concerned, they will see lazy list. They will not see what's inside it. Right. They might not know whether it's implemented with cons or with, for example, Leonid streaming stuff or however in the end it's implemented. Right. And it might be different in different cases. Okay. So there's lazy list. There's lazy tree. Is that correct? Yeah. Should we call it yeah. like lazy list? Because I have it like just a convert or a ordinary list to a lazy one. That, that's fine. It can be a yeah, constructor and yeah. also be the thing that represents it. I mean, we have right. that's what it should be. Lazy list. Boom. It's, that's what it is. Until further notice, that's what it is. Right. And it is the it can be the constructor, this this trivial constructor, and it can be the actual thing. Sure. Makes sense. But I mean, like there are things like, for example, here's a random example is like packlet object. If you say packlet object of a string, it evaluates to packlet object of an association, which is the actual packlet object. So, I mean, you can have constructors that are also the heads of the actual objects. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, but in, in this list, you should just have lazy list, nothing else. No constructor belongs in here. What do you mean? Well, I mean, it's the object is lazy list. Yes, that's and what we're talking about. Yes, so delete the one, two, three. No, no, that should work. I mean, it, it should yeah, be. Yeah, it should work, but it's not a data type. The lazy list dot of dot 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 okay is what should be what no you never type you never type lazy list yes you do if you want that's to make a, it that's a, a return a, object no 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 roman if you want to yeah. make a lazy list from an ordinary yes. list you would type lazy list of one okay system. in this particular case yes in this particular very uninteresting case yes yes but it's otherwise you would lazy, lazy range lazy nest list whatever. exactly exactly Yes. And so I find it confusing so. if you if you have. No, well, so don't type it there, Nick. Just get rid of that. Just lazy list. I, mean, I think it's, it's fair that, it, you know, that, that should work. I mean, it you, should you, work. we have yeah, finite lazy work, lists. But it doesn't belong in do here. It. It's not very useful. Just delete it. Okay. Delete the one, two, three. Yeah. You put it elsewhere as a constructor. Okay. Uh, well, okay, but. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. Okay. All right. So So now. Okay, so we've got lazy list, and lazy list is what is returned by lazy range, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, correct? Yes. Okay, is that what happens now? Well, if it cons would actually be wrapped. No, 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 I don't care about yeah. cons. I don't right, care about it... the cons. Okay, I just, what, what, what is well, the Right now, it return? returns cons. Okay, fine, but it should return lazy list, and that lazy list can have all kinds of cool you know, formatting, dynamic stuff, et cetera. Am I making sense? Yeah. I think that's an important point that lazy list wouldn't uh, force a single implementation. It would just contain yes, exactly. an object that satisfies a certain interface that knows how to do things, that knows how to format itself and so on. And then we can, depending on the situation, have different different constructors return different flavors of lazy list exactly exactly right exactly which would be interconvertible probably by wrapping a lazy list around the lazy list and and being able to give some kind of option that is corresponds to a converter i mean the, the point one point is that if you create one then you normally have to decide which implementation to use because you need, need to call a constructor. So lazy range and so on might just choose whatever 
No, they'll they'll Seems choose to fit a, they'll, best or they'll, could... they'll choose whatever fits mm -hmm. the functions best. But, but you, you could still have a way use to... you could still use a raw constructor from running the implementation and just wrap lazy list around it and everything will work. So if you need a lazy list with uh, caching enabled, you would use a particular constructor. No, and... well, I, I don't think that's how you would do it. I think you would have um, something like lazy list options, arrow, blah, blah, blah. And that would be a, an option to lazy range, for example. Yeah, that, lazy that's, options that's or something. additional possibility to, to do it. Well, I wouldn't do it that way. I would say, what are you doing? Method or method or method well, option. Think, or... Yeah, it's either a method option or something like that. What, what, what is that cached list? Nick, what is that cached list doing? Well, that's what the one suggestion that Roman had. Well, well, no, well, but it's not an, it's not a, it's not an argument. It's an option. Yeah. Method, method cached. To, to function for range. Yes, right, exactly. Right. Okay, this is a bad one. Yeah, right. Okay, I don't think it should be called method, but the, it's close enough. Okay. All right, so now lazy range the idea is lazy range returns a lazy list which is a basically opaque object its print form can include this very beautiful idea of next of this you know debugging you know press a button to get another element mm -hmm. does that make but sense it should include the actual data type just like all the other object it should be lazy lazy list of Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. It's not a cons thing. We already no, no, understood. No, no, the, the, the format, print form yeah. should, oh, should see, have I the see. lazy lazy list around it, probably just as it yes. does with all other objects. Probably yes, probably yes. Otherwise, Nick, you don't know what it is. Nick, does that make sense? Yeah. Right. So and so Kristen, you're, you're, you're taking good have... notes here so that, so that we yes. will really see this next time. Right? The... Okay. What the heck is that? That's nothing. That doesn't make any sense. What is that? What is F? Well, if I actually, it's a place order for some kind of new type of lazy. Oh, it, lazy range. Look, presumably, okay, what are the typical arguments to lazy range? Is it a symbolic thing? What is it? It's a, what is F? What the, the heck is F? It's an additional argument that the range, usual range doesn't have. It's a basically a head for construction of a lazy object. No, 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 it shouldn't do that. No, absolutely not. Re same lazy thing. range just means the same thing as range. What the heck is that extra head doing? No, we well, don't want that. Well, that can be a part of a method or an option. We don't want it. Lazy range returns a lazy list, and that's all it returns. Not something else. Oh, if you want a function, you you apply so, so, the function to a lazy. So list. I think the idea is with, with, with cached, right? I mean, so okay. I think the idea is that no matter what, you know, a function like lazy range always returns something with head lazy list. The internals, you know, all that you know about lazy list is that it implements, you know, the function first. It implements the function rest, and it maybe implements a whole set of other functions. That's all you know about it. And and you know, you don't know. For example, there might be different implementations of that lazy list. One yeah, that's based that's on fine. streaming, one's based on cons, et cetera. But, but the point is the head is always lazy list. Right. And, and I don't want to see any arguments that are some kind of wacky F thing. If there's a method argument, fine. But the actual arguments should just be simply the arguments to range. Does that make sense, Nick? Well, yeah, but okay. But but if you but still, how, what about this one? What about it? Well, because there's the cache there, the cache, that's just about the internal representation inside the lazy list black well, box. Well, that's what it's representing, right? It's like it's uh, not. It's not representing that. There's no F there. There's well, no, nothing there's like that there. The, well, the this point is going to make a new object. Okay, that that's not what we rate. care about. It's what we care about is implementing lazy that. list using built-in methods. Well, no, 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 but hold, hold on. I mean, maybe just, just to explain it. So if you look at sparse array, Actually, I'm not sure sparse array has this option, but it, it might have this option, right? Where maybe if you had a sparse array, you could tell it, do I want a row based or like a row oriented or a column oriented sparse array, right? Yes. Or, or whatever yes. it's called. This this you know? has some wacky thing which says make a sparse array there. That is wrong. That's the wrong way to do it. It's not what we want. We do not want that for lazy range. 
No, no, but, but, but hold, hold on. Let me just does the explain the example of sparse array. The point is the head is always sparse array. Every function you apply to it doesn't care, doesn't act any differently depending on whether it's row or column oriented. It's purely for performance optimization that you can pick one. But there might still be functions where you can specify as a method option, whether it's row or column oriented. So, you know. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but it doesn't right. change the head or anything like that. Right. And it doesn't, I don't want to see an F there. Right. We're never going to see an F there. It's going to say lazy list. If you've put some some complicated thing inside, fine, but we'll never see it. Does that make sense, Nick? So, well, we can, we, we can make it not like displayed like this, but should it actually be a lazy There won't list be an F there. there. It will be a built-in. Listen, there will be several built-in implementations, one initially. They will be quite invisible to the user. We will not have the possibility of a user adding their own implementation initially. Does that make sense? Sure, but they all would have the same lazy list head. Yes. And there's no method. There's no F there. Just get rid of that F. What the, What is that F supposed to represent? Just a different lazy list with different implementation. Okay, but we don't want that. Okay. We don't well, want it, that. It, we it only be, want one implementation. No, no, it could be a string, which represents, I mean, I, I think, ignore the output of this line. If if that F was a string, it's something like cached or whatever that you yeah, want to call that's it. Fine. That's fine, right? It's, it's just that I think the output cell is the terrifying part yeah, here. We don't want something where you can set an arbitrary thing. A lazy yeah. list is, a, is an opaque it. lazy list. Right, yeah. okay, that's it. That's the, the, I mean, so lazy range returns okay no, no no you should fill that in lazy range of one comma well, you, that that all that other stuff is irrelevant but lazy range just lazy range of infinity right lazy range open close is lazy range of infinity yes right and that's, so which just, is let's, just one to n so so lazy range of open close is lazy range of infinity is lazy range of one comma you know infinity yeah. so lazy yeah. let's let's lazy range of of like two for example don't don't, don't copy the line Lazy range of, of like two probably is two comma infinity. You know, is, is the equivalent of range two comma infinity. I mean, it's just a bit or, confusing or, because the normal range has, when it has only one argument, it's the upper bound and not the standard. Yeah, so maybe it isn't. Maybe that's the wrong thing. So the, that's the question. Is that lazy table? Okay, no, no, no. That, that, that lazy range of two, maybe it doesn't support lazy range of two. Well, Maybe suppose, it goes in steps. You can have like right? a lazy list, but it's finite. Where it's, where it's a problem. Yes, why not? Why not? Well, that, that's a finite lazy list of just two elements. Yeah. So it is the equivalent. So lazy range of two is the equivalent of lazy list of range of two. Could you write that, please? So range of two. And then lazy okay. list of that. Lazy list of that. Lazy list of range of two. Okay. Right? Which makes a rather uninteresting finite lazy list, right? So, so as a as a as a maybe in a principle, which I think we should do for for all these functions if we can. I mean, the arguments of range, the argument if okay, if range is defined on this set of arguments, lazy range should generate the analogous lazy list. I so, think so you know, yes. yeah, yeah. But lazy range of no arguments is not defined, so we can make lazy range. The, right. the infinite case. La lazy range supports a superset of what range does because it can also do infinite ones and it can do, you know, yeah. All right. You can't okay. usually put infinity in range. Right. Okay. So by, by the way, what I'm expecting here is that between Nick and Ian, you know, a bunch of these things will get sort of implemented and, um, uh, and then Kristen is going to make sure that they get implemented and they get put on guide page. Right? Right, Kristen? Yes. Okay. All right. So let's keep going now. So we've got now lazy list and lazy range. So let's go back up to the, the top there. Well, I'm sorry. Maybe it was further down. Well, you had that list of functions. There we go. Okay. So we think, let, let's just write out for some of these what we think they'll be. Okay. So lazy table. Okay. Okay. It should be some expa, comma, and then comma i, I guess. And that is a different syntax from table itself, right? Because that would be a variable there. Because table itself, it would be 
No, that doesn't work. It will be table itself, i comma two, for example. So this lazy table will be the equivalent of of expert of i comma infinity, right? Table of i. It's a little comma. unfortunate if it's not different. Yes, it's but... a little unfortunate. I mean, one one point I forget if we talked about this last time, but you can really easily if if, if table only makes if, if sorry if lazy table only makes sense in essentially the one dimensional case. It's really easy to implement the same thing by just mapping over a lazy range. Yeah, I know, but I th still think a lazy table is nice because I think that's a that will be a very common constructor. Maybe. Uh, okay, what about the two dimensional lazy table? I mean, it can it can do it can make a lazy list of lazy lists, although it'll be a pretty awkward representation. But does that? But I don't understand that because I would think that a lazy table, a multi-dimensional lazy table, is precisely one of our non-trivial sort of graph-based. We don't know where the evaluation front is, kind of things. Am I wrong? That is a multi-dimensional lazy table is a meaningful thing. No, but it's a DAG, and it's not a graph. It's it's a you know. No, I know, I know, but I, I'm I'm saying that I think that is a worthwhile and meaningful thing, but a bit more advanced. I mean, lazy. I mean, but it's like the semantics of it should just fall out of the semantics of the one-dimensional lazy list. Right. If you have a lazy list of lazy lists. It's it's like once you have the semantics of lazy list, the semantics of a of a nested lazy list is completely defined. There's nothing to decide. Well, wait a minute. Well, but but if you were going to evaluate it, you can go different. You can go down these threads. But that's the same as lazy list. list. It's the same as la if, if we've defined a way that late that you can ask lazy list to show you, you know, it's 10th element or to evaluate in this order that completely defines how a lazy list of lazy lists would do no, the no, same but, thing. But, but wait, wait a second. No, it doesn't because, because you might actually want a specific set of elements, which would be like a depth first traversal or something of the lazy list of lazy lists, which would go down the first lazy list of the, of the sub, the first sub lazy list first as opposed to a breadth first traversal of that, which would go down, you know, one level in each of the sub lazy lists. I, I, I don't understand what you mean at all, because this is just the same thing that you get with a list of lists. It doesn't matter what the ordering is. There's only a unique way to get to each element. You know, each element has a unique address. Yeah, I understand that. I understand that. But like, if you say, if you say produce me a, okay, so, so right now, uh, I mean, you know, take of a lazy list does what? What does take of a lazy list do? Does it return a lazy list or does it return something explicit? If you ask for a span, it should return a lazy list. And if you ask for a, uh, well, actually, I guess it should always return a lazy list. Part should be able to return a, a, an element. Okay, so let's write that down. Okay. So part, okay, so with sparse array, yeah. okay, part, okay, part returns something non lazy, right? So we should write that. Can you write well, that? Well, not down? always, because you have to, it's the same as sparse array. With a span, yeah, okay. it would return another one. Well, there's a, for the part for the lazy, least i think should be still lazy no not like, no, no, shouldn't no. Be. not well, if you say part the two same as part, it should be the same as sparse array right. which has already solved this problem should it be like, uh, if you have like asking for a millionth element in an infinite list should it like evaluate immediately to something or should you should wait or you should just produce a lazy object that you can then peel off how would you then get okay fair fair well, point Fair point. It could it could lazily ask for the millionth part. Well, I, I, yes, I think I that's an interesting point. But at the same time, we'd have to okay, we'd have to introduce another type of lazy object. Yes, we would. It's unclear what its corresponding. No, it's not right. Is. It's not right. It's not right to do this. Okay, so you can't have a lazy version of every single function. That that will not work. No, it's like. This is how implemented currently. No, no. You, Why do you have lazy drop? It wasn't in the list of functions. It was not in our list of functions. We wanted a complete list of functions. It's not in it. Oh, I still need it. <laughs> you, you, I, I okay, just... so then then add it to the list of functions. Kristen, do you have that guide page that had the list of functions? I want to see the whole list of functions, not just, oh, I just thought of this other thing. Let's add a whole other direction here. Okay. Some direction I just actually needed for implementing some of the other ones. But, but it may or may not be something that, look, 
I, I don't believe in this. I'm sorry. I just don't believe in this. Every function, lazy depth. We could have every single function in the system. We could have a lazy version of it, couldn't we? Well, uh, yes. I mean, all the all the list functions should have a lazy equivalent, but they, they shouldn't necessarily. We, we just went symbols. through it's this last time. Usage. Look, I'm sorry. Value. I'm kind of upset because last time we went through this, we came to a conclusion. We're now changing that. The conclusion we came to last time is we do not have a lazy select. All we have is a select that operates on lazy objects, right? So why are we yes, seeing I lazy that... select here again? Well, we can't, we can't go backwards like this. Like we got to go forwards. Okay, this is just a actual implementation. I'm not thinking much of a design. Okay, I understand. Yeah, but we're, we're trying to we're trying to nail down a design because without a design, we can't see how this is going to work. So it's important that when you have these things, that you make it so that the design we come up with is actually the one that we see the next time, not going backwards. So so most of these functions are just going to go away. Right? So drop, for example, it's just drop. We have a limited number of constructors that are specifically lazy. And then all the other functions are just up values. Is that right? No, they still have up values for most of them. Like drop has a level. Last okay, then, then we don't need lazy drop. Let's get rid of it. Right, that's just the implementation the function the, that's, the that's not in the private context, but it could be in a private context. Okay, yeah, fine. Yeah, let's make it private. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That, that's, that's what we do because we don't want to see these. We want to see just the clean list of functions that we're actually trying to explain to people. Yeah, I think the principle is the the only functions with lazy, starting with lazy, are the constructors. That's what I think. But but is, does anybody disagree with that? I mean, we have we have two difficult no, but, to decide but, but, cases, and that is part and take, as you asked before. I mean, I would argue that if you ask for the millionth part, you do so because you want it and not delay it to, to infinity or so. And take is a bit uh, difficult. Take is very useful to just have a look at, at an initial segment of, of a lazy list. And I personally can't see a lot of use of take that returns a lazy list. But Well, but I, I can definitely see, for example, well, certainly for part of a span, just as with sparse arrays, it's useful to you know, get subarrays and stuff like that. I have to imagine that'll be useful for lazy lists as well. And I think if we do that, it's kind of only consistent if take does that too. I mean, well, I, I just think we should emulate sparse arrays, basically. Yes, okay, but data set also has a somewhat annoying feature that it always ends you up with a data set, even if there's just one element. Right, but that's, 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 but that's because data set represents, so, right. What did that data just set do? Represents any... Sorry, Nick, Nick, what did that just do? You did a sparse, a lazy range, Oh, it just doesn't work. What doesn't work? Well, I'm sorry, what doesn't work? That seemed to work just fine. What doesn't the work? The laser range oh. three to five is broken. Oh, okay. I see, I see, I see, I see. Okay, fine. Just correct. Okay, but I was saying data set. Data set fundamentally, you know, is a representation of lists of associations or atoms. It can do all three of those. Okay. This only represents lists. So it doesn't represent atoms. Okay, fine. All right. So how would you easily get the first 10 elements of a lazy list? I think it would be normal of take of 10. Like Is normal of take easy enough? So why not just take... Uh, That's what we were just discussing, Nick. Well, I mean, right. I mean, I, I'm advocating that you have to say normal. No, no. no but, because, but, right. I mean, so the question, Nick, is whether that returns the normal thing or not. Right. Let's initially natural, I mean, implement it without... Let's initially implement it so that you have to say normal and let's find out how annoying it is. I'm pretty sure it's going to be annoying. <laughs> okay, well, fine. Just implement it so that you have to say normal and we'll decide that that's a bad thing. But we can't tell anything until as we've got it implemented in the design that we have, right? Now, what about part? I mean, the, the original idea for part was just to be uh, element access, right? A tenth part or so. Then yeah. we extended it to ranges and spans. and. But... Well, I mean, the, the one question is, if you give it a lazy list, if you say lazy list part lazy list, what does it do? 
<laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. Well, let's 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 solve the, the easy case first. Uh, I would argue that part at least shouldn't shouldn't should not return a lazy list. Actually, lazy list comma lazy list I think is well defined because it's the same as mapping. Yeah, you know, I think lazy, so too. You know, yeah, it is. It, yeah, it's a bit funky, but <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Fine. But that's what we have There's to no actually implement that this case explicitly, be a lazy list. Roman. That's why we have mm -hmm. to implement this explicitly because we're never going to see these things until we've actually got something where we can write code with a lot of extra hair on it. Fair. Okay. So we, we we've got. Okay. So we were talking about table. We've got to try and come up with a syntax. Do you want it? Do we need to do that now, or can you just implement something reasonable, Nick, that we can then review? And, and Kristen, can you make sure that we have some documentation for whether it is implemented, at least a usage message for it? Yes. Okay. And okay. then we'll go through those and see whether it actually made sense. But I think Nick should try and think them through and come up with what he thinks is the right way thing to do. And then let's look at them. Does that sound reasonable, Nick? Yeah. Well, what about this part? Which part? Because, uh, but it's like having this unwrappable one by one object. Yes, I said I think that's nice. But as we've said four times or something here, we want the outer in the print form. It should say lazy list, open bracket, and this then it can have some. I'm sorry? The point is that this is not a list. What until is it? Fill, until, un, until you unwrap it. No, but that's wrong. Okay, what we keep on saying is the head of the object returned is lazy list. Wait, no, no sorry. This is a different, this is a different point. So let me understand, Nick, what you just said. So basically this is, okay, when you have a cons list, you know, if you want to get, if you want to drop the first 100,000 elements, you actually have to iterate it 100,000 times, you know, yeah. to, to get the next one, right? And so the point is that this drop here did not iterate it 100,000 times. So when you actually call normal on this, it's going to have to iterate it. Effectively what that did is it replaced the first 100,000 elements with nothing. The, the symbol nothing, as opposed to actually iterating it a hundred thousand times, because because th this matters though. Because for example, if this was you know if that lazy range was instead the list of Fibonacci numbers, and it would take it a long time to iterate a hundred thousand times, but you, you run drop it. on it and it would sit there. Oh, right? on. There's anyway. a much more basic point: normal of lazy range open close. Right? What does it do? Try it right now. Normal well, uh, infinite loop of lazy range open close. It's going to recursion it's limit. It's going to so, hang. Okay. If I, and if I abort it, it's just going to return whatever it generated so far. Oh, right. gosh. That's, that's, that's a interesting. terrifying. <laughs> that's interesting. But okay, this is wrong. It should not do what it just did without messages and things like that. Well, no, so, sorry, hold on. No, it, it can't know whether or not it'll terminate. In the case of oh, lazy I, I range, know that. It I realize, but I realize it in can't. general, it can't. Yeah, I, I realize it can't. But if you give a partial result on interrupt, you should say something when you generate that partial result. I, I, agree. I agree. Right. In fact, the partial result should probably be exactly the thing that we're using for recursion limit, which is terminated evaluation. Right. Do, do, do you see what I'm saying? Rather than a message, use the wrapper terminated evaluation, which is the wrapper that we're using when something hits the recursion limit. It's a new one. It's a new wrapper, yes. Terminated evaluation. That would be my suggestion for what to return in that case. Terminate evaluation of whatever that you've got so far. Does that make sense? Open bracket what you've got so far, right? All right. Okay, but I mean, this thing that's just going to, you know, okay. So now the question is that drop of lazy range. So what is that thing that's coming back? It's another lazy list. No, but the is lazy, it a lazy list? list. It's a it's a delayed lazy. No, list. no, 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 no. We don't get another function. There's no new function called lazy. We don't have that. We've got a fixed list of functions, and that's what we're using. Oh right? well, we we'll just solve this problem. I don't know how to solve this problem, but we don't well, solve this problem by wheeling in another yeah. function that we haven't talked about. Wait, okay. first of all, whether it's another function or not is irrelevant because I mean that that, that could just be wrapped up in how the lazy list is internally represented. This is a purely kind of technical, basically implementation specific question. It's not even one that, you know, if we had, you know, if we had, you know, Leonid streaming stuff, it would have a different answer to this question. 
but so but you this, think that the return value of this that that output line should be lazy list of something is well that i mean right? doesn't drop That's drop right? of a list returns a list yes right? of course it returns yes. a list right so, so i don't understand what, what the issue is i mean the Nick, question is the do you figure it out right now and i think you have to because it if it's shorter than 1 million or 100,000, then you would have to generate an error. You could also just delay, delay it until you actually use it. But well, in this case, okay, uh, this is clear. Lazy. Drop should, should generate a list. But what about other functions that return but, something else than a list? I, I, well, I, I think actually, just to respond to Roman, I'm not sure to return a message. I, like, I understand why. I mean, right, the natural implementation of this. It is much more natural if drop is quote unquote a little bit eager in that it actually, you know, it'll fail if, for example, there aren't a hundred thousand elements or something. Yes, like that's that. that's what but I, I meant. think. Right. But but I think in terms of the semantics of it, I do think it's probably preferable, even if the internals aren't as elegant in this case, if it does if it's if it really is lazy and doesn't do anything when you first run drop. Okay, I've got a more basic you. question. F of lazy range open close. Just F of that. And if you, unless you defined your F in some crazy way before. Okay, right. the question is, what is this? It's just, just a, what? It's just F of lazy it's not range. Listable. It's not only, listable. Yeah. So, okay, so okay. Then, then, then this is, okay, right. So it does nothing. So it doesn't go inside. So I see yeah, only like, a listable like, function. But the result of lazy fold is another one. I mean, that that should just be a single expression. And if the lazy range is infinite, then there will be no result. Right. So the question is, what does that return? Because it can't return a lazy list because the lazy list isn't. It isn't. No, it, a list. it's one of those functions that consumes the whole input. And so, so just what like is that normal, function? just right. like normal, it will have to wait until it has done its thing. Okay, so that was the thing that Nick was calling there something like lazy. But what's the relationship between that and, um, I mean, perhaps there's a concept of lazy value. Yeah, that's that's what I'm trying uh, to explain. Right, but I, like, this is not returning a lazy list, right? But it's still... Yeah, okay, so fine. So I'm suggesting right, but, a function name be lazy value. No, but I think, I think Roman made this point earlier, which is sort of that, I mean, first of all, I don't see many situations where you're going to ask for this value where you don't just want the value, like where we shouldn't just get to the point and give it to you because you're. Not I know, but gonna... what if it can't? What if it can't? If the lazy, oh, I see. You're you're saying. I mean, when are you going to act, act? When are you going to get this thing and then not run normal on it? There's nothing you can do to it other than run normal on it eventually. Oh, you can drop it. It can be a part of some like lazy object itself that you don't care about. But, but but I mean like if you and don't do it in the first place, right? Well, but I mean right. Like if you generate a list of ten thousand of these, and maybe I only care about the hundredth or something like that, it's sort of like uh, and and the point is okay. I can I only have to run normal on the one hundredth one, <laughs> but it's sort of uh, it, it seems better if you can just like Roman said, not generate the list of the thousand. No, well, I don't so think it's, the it's it's, a, it's still it's like it's for programmer for programming convenience. You should care less about actual numbers where you do care and don't care about things that you want to drop. You just okay, generate so things. But let's, how does this what does how, what can you do to this thing? To this lazy value? Well this is I a, think that a, this lazy value right guys, guys, mm -hmm. look, okay. Look a simple case is total of lazy range, open close. Okay. I mean, yes, it's the same as this as, as the fold. I mean, except that <laughs> there is a value you can give. It's infinity. No, it's well, not. You, you definitely don't know cannot that. do that. Why? Okay. No, what if in I that particular case. From, no, no, no. What if I have a range that's one minus one, two minus two, three minus? I mean, among other things, like no, no. But but this particular case, total of lazy range is infinity. Yeah, that is hopeless to do in general. No, I understand. I mean, obviously, it's hopeless. hopeless. Wait, wait. wait. Okay, Nick. Well, these this are, these proliferation are... of random functions is just not going to make it. Okay. I mean, okay. There are interesting ideas here. Okay, so for example, 
this lazy clone thing is like a representation of a non-terminating computation, right? It's just like one representation is it is re a repeating non-terminating computation. Is that correct? Well, yeah, the name it's clone is kind of strange. Or... It's very strange and it's wrong. But I mean, the I mean, it, it's something like repeated. I mean, it's it's infinite concatenation, isn't it? Or... It is. Well, the, the name clone comes from just it's a Haskell equivalent. Yes, but I mean, it's not in, in our context, cloning yeah, right. a mutable object means to make a copy of, of a mutable object. And not... Yeah, it's not the right thing. It's just not no. the right thing. So, I mean, but the main point here is just conceptually, this thing is an example of an infinite structure that has a fairly simple form, just as an infinite binary tree is an infinite structure with a fairly simple form. Am I making yeah, sense? a totally different infinite structure with a different form. No, I, I know that, but I'm saying that there are a limited number of constructors of, of simple infinite structures. No, uh, the, the more important point is that there's a limited number of the more important point is that we have a limited number of structures in our language where we have existing functions for managing them. We can manage tree-shaped things, list-shaped things, you know, graph-shaped things, whatever, nearest function-shaped things. And, and if you can find some lazy equivalent to any of those forms, you can make a lazy version of it. But we shouldn't say like, oh, well, you know, we could have some object that represents, you know, a hypergraph. We don't right now, but we could have one. So let's make a lazy hypergraph and we'll have to invent a whole set of functions for manipulating it yeah, instead yeah, of just right. making up values for existing ones. Right. That's what we want to avoid. Exactly. But I'm and, saying and it should that be I very think... clear that, that each of these lazy blank objects represents one thing. Okay. I just, this, this concept of a repeating, you know, a periodic, I mean, we do have an example of this in, uh, you know, repeating decimals is an example of this. But, but, but see, look, you, if, if, you want, if you want to make this repeating thing, that's just one minus one, one minus one, you should do that in the same way that you do it with lists. So one way of doing it would be to do something like, you know, constant Table. array of list one minus one, uh, comma, you know, comma infinity, and then you run catenate on that. Another one would be yeah, uh, table, you know, of, table of mod of, you know, and uh, okay, but this one, is again, right? This is, hold, hold on. This is again something like constant array is a useful construct that you could say you never need it because you can always just use table, but we eventually introduced it because one needs it often enough. And this might be the same way. So again, it's something where it needs to be on Kristen's list of things. Yeah. We need to have the best design we can have. It needs to be on some kind of extras list in the guide page. Does that make sense? I mean, so there's, one inter there's one interesting idea here. Say, if, if I want to use a join of a bunch of lazy lists, that should obviously work. And it will not be very useful if the first one is infinite, but still. But if you want to say join of an infinite number of arguments, then we need some kind of like this clone thing. So to say, use a lazy list or anything else as the independent arguments of another function. That would probably be a bit esoteric, but might be useful. No, I'm telling you, the case that's interesting is right now we are used to finite terminating computations. Okay, that's what our language primarily deals with. What we are walking into here is infinite non-terminating computations, beginning with non-terminating data structures, infinite data structures. Am I making sense? Right, except you, you praise this very generally, but the nice thing uh -huh. about a case like this is that it is extremely well-defined when things evaluate, where they evaluate, yeah. et cetera. Right. I, I so just don't need really to worry about this kind of do thing. not like seeing these other random functions like lazy eval is yet another random function. We've really got to cut this down. Okay, that's why I wanted last time I asked for us to produce a guide page, which we didn't do. We need to do that now. Okay, or well, Kristen, did you in fact produce part of a guide page? If so, let's see it. No, the guide page I have is Nick's guide page currently. I'll make a separate one with these. Well, okay, but, but Nick, do you meeting. have a complete guide page for everything that you've implemented here? Um, I don't think it's complete. Okay, it's, but it, it's really important that we not just have these random extra functions that suddenly show up. Okay, we're trying to have a tight design, not something where we just have random functions showing up. 
Should be designed done after the actual implementation is done. No, no, it But, should be done before the implementation, as much as possible. Because we'll never I think, understand. I think often if the implementation comes entirely first, then the, then you realize that all of a sudden the design actually you know totally changes the semantics of what you thought you were going to make, and then and then the implementation is wrong. Well, right now, look at the those all those random functions, just private functions. Okay, I just use it for right. Okay, fine, but then then tell us what the public functions are, and that's what we should look at. Okay. Oh well. But and not right now. I mean, let's make this list systematically. What does this lazy eval thing do? It's the equivalent of take, right? No, it not doesn't actually take anything. It's the same as clicking this thing ten times. I see. So it's, it's like lazy. Uh, it's a formatting thing. Lazy form. Not the formatting. It actually expands. You put it. echo. You know, right? If, 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 if it was, yeah. Like instead of this thing having some kind of lazy generator, doesn't have all of the numbers generated yet. It generates a bunch of them explicitly. And I understand, but this product. is a caching play. I mean, this is basically saying, in, in any actual function that I apply to this object, will be the same whether or not I have done a lazy eval, right? Yeah. Yeah. Gonna... Behavior should be the same. Right. Behavior... Any any computational function applied to that object will not be affected by whether a lazy eval was applied to the object. Right. Right. So the lazy eval is a print form, basically affects the print form, right? And well, yeah, and some caching. And, and caching, which is not what we're caring about right now, right? I mean, the caching stuff is, you know, the the hacking of the cache, which might not even be possible if this was streaming or whatever else, is a completely separate issue, which can be achieved by doing something like you know wrapping a lazy list with another cache descriptor. But I mean, so I suspect this is something which is more like a print form, like lazy form or something. I don't know. I'm not sure. Anyway, okay, let's keep going here. Yeah. So, so you had you had. I mean, the the really important thing is let's see what the actual proposed exposed functions are. Okay. The, uh, okay. Now you've got lazy find path, which we don't understand at all because that depends on lazy tree. Correct. Correct. Okay, so lazy tree is an as another lazy constructed thing, correct? Like right. lazy list, it is a it is a core lazy data structure, correct? Correct. And in addition to this, we might have a lazy graph, although that is more complicated in its semantics. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Well, we're going to need something like lazy graph. But exactly how it works and whether it's a DAG and how it is not clear. But I only okay. understand like the lazy expression. So because it, and everything is expression in the Wolfram language, so we can make a lazy expression. And if it's a graph, then it can be made to, made into a graph. I well, just think graph is a more special case. I, yeah, and I also I think lazy expressions. We should probably not launch the lazy expressions right now. But I think that's the problem with lazy expressions is that what's the API for it? And the answer is probably just everything. It has some up value so that basically anything you apply to it other than say normal just gets sort of eaten up by it. Maybe a little bit like how multi does this. Um, but I think that's a very weird and, and impossible to use thing if it existed. Right. Okay, so let's keep going here. So, so we've got, uh, So lazy tree is constructed how? Like, for example, this is one of the... Okay, what other lazy. constructors are there? Uh, well, well, nest lazy kind of, it's the same thing. Well, well, I don't understand it. I don't understand it. Can, can we, can we decide, say what less nest lazy would actually well, nest lazy be? Nest lazy is experimental thing. I understand, but let's talk about what it would actually be. Right, not not what you implemented it as, but what what a plausible design for an actual thing like that is. It's a it's basically a multi-way, lazy multi-way generator, something like that. Right now, 
right? It's supposed to be mi mimic the arguments for when we are generating all the multi-way graphs and things like that. So it's a function, yeah, I understand. a list of rules and the list of initial conditions instead of having an explicit number of steps. You just not don't have it anymore. It's just an infinite in general. Right. I don't think the name is right. Well, did we yeah. did we come up with a better name last time? I don't think so. But my plan was. Oh, like, Kristen, what name did we come up with for this last time? I don't recall a specific name. I was going to implement something like that with the same thing for the list of rules and just using the down values and generating the same kind of structure. Okay, what we discussed last time, remember what we discussed last time, three cases, function application, replacement rules, and down value evaluation, right? Those are the three cases in which we're constructing, we're, we're creating structures that are essentially, uh, you know, lazy slash multi type structures right remember that yep okay so those are the th three things that we need functions to implement right all right so what That's are why... those functions what are the well, proposed because... functions there because these well, aren't these are not they. no but they're not this is not those functions we've got three things we need to have functions well, we, for we haven't come up with the actual name but okay we need our actual names because we need those are the specific functions we need to implement, not something different, but those specific ones. Okay. Right? Those specific functions. So I don't know what their names should be, but we need to decide and then implement those specific functions. Well, we can use something with multi way. That will be okay. So I mean it's it's multi multi way replace, uh, multi, multi way. Nest. Yeah, multi way nest. Multi-way replace and multi-way evaluate. Yes. Okay, so let's try this. So let's look at the argument structure for these. So multi-way nest would be a list of functions, presumably. Let's, let's write it out. Or just one. List. Okay. Oh, you think it's just one function? I, I see. It's one function one. that returns a list. Yeah, right, exactly. Okay. It's a, it's a multi output function. Yep. Yep, I agree. Okay. Multi-way replace. So that would have a list of rules, presumably. Yeah. And these uh, rules would have uh, yeah, right. So init's is always a list of init's. Okay, multi-way evaluate. Expression. I think nothing else. That's it. Yep. Right. I agree with you. Now, those things would all return what? Computation objects or what? It's, uh, so to return a lazy list as we had before, before, but it should contain lazy, no, it's not, it's not lazy list of lazy trees. We can, and we none can of the above. It's nothing like that. No. Multi-way nest is an expression. It should return this. <laughs> Perhaps, but we already discussed things like this. Okay, fine. We, why don't you implement it this way to begin with? Inside it, but it should contain... No, just... no. It doesn't... We're not defining what it has inside. Because it... Yeah, right. But that's... But it, it one might have that inside, but you will not show that to the user, probably. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just inside of the internal data. So. Right. Okay. All right. So now, okay. All right. So multi-way nest then. Okay. So then we have, I'm, I'm still a little bit confused. From the multi-way object, if you get a single slice of the multi-way object that came out of multi-way nest, you will get a multi from that. Is that correct? Like if you have the breadth first, you know, three steps of breadth first evaluation of the multi-way object. I would just get another multi-way object. You just can slice it and you get another one. Doesn't matter. Okay, what is the slicing function? So the slicing function is some kind of, you know, 
It's a list. It's a basically extract. How, how do yes, you, but you, I, I understand that. But it's a more complicated thing because it has to be a multi-way version of that. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Because it's got to define what to do on every multi-way branch. It's exactly the thing we've been talking about many times here about oh, traversal mean, orders, etc., etc., etc. Sure, but I mean, I mean, if you already decided that, and you have a list of positions in this uh, infinite lazy list, lazy list of trees, and you have a list of positions. Even this list of positions can be itself infinite. You can use an extract of the multiple object and it would generate a new multiple object. I understand, but what I'm saying is, let's say you want the fifth breadth first, you know, cosmological rest frame slice of the multi-way object. How do you get it explicitly? Well, I guess there should be some kind of traverse function that takes a multi-way object like this. You maybe it's some kind of traversal order option for it, like tap first, right? And it should generate as a lazy list. It's basically a path of values. And well, okay, should... there are two different things we want here. There are two things we want. Okay, one is a total order. So you should write this down. One thing you might want is a total order from that multi way object. And that's what you're describing here. So if the multi-way object was, in fact, a tree, the total order will be defined by a traversal, by a tree traversal order. Right, Ian, can you confirm that? Yep. Okay. The other thing you might want, which is relevant for many of our scientific applications, is a partial order. Making sense? And that's where you have a foliation and you have, uh, you know, you have... Um, um uh what are they called? Um antichains. Right? Partial order, you say paren antichains. Right? Did, did you see what I'm saying? I understand, but what what how do we should extract it actually? That's know. what we've been talking about many times before, right? We we've been discussing that over and over again. We know we need a domain-specific language to specify partial orders, right? And we have certain reference frames that will be named reference frames. So in the case of total order, okay, the total order, we've already got that domain-specific language which Ian has defined for trees. Right, Ian? Right. We basically have depth first and then breadth first starting from all of the roots or from all of the leaves. Right, but you are defining a total order there. So we don't have quite the definition of partial orders, which is going to look a lot like reference frames and, and you know, relativity and so on. Because it's going to be, you know, we can imagine a boosted frame, for example, a rest frame, a, a cosmological rest frame, a boosted frame, etc. Does that make sense to people? It's a little bit confusing because it suggest a causal graph if you're talking about it but we're not even discussing causality of any of those well are we not discussing causality doesn't every one of those functions multi-way nest multi-way replace and so on doesn't that define a causal set of causal relationships well it can define it but in general if you not specify what actually like been created and destroyed for example you can do it. You have like a very really trivial causal graph and just just follow the arrows. If you follow the arrows or in event, basically make a line graph out of your multi way graph. Yeah. So you can't say anything extra about that. Right, I understand. But so so there's a separate thing. You should make a note of this. Kristen should make a note of this. We've got, I mean, It is the case, is it not, that there's a meaningful sense of a partial order in a generic multi-way graph? Right? There's a meaningful sense of an anti-chain. Well, what about the possibility of closed loops or closed time-like curves? Then you're toast. Yeah, and I think that can happen in general. 
Well, I don't think it can happen in those functions. Multi-way nest, multi-way replace, multi multi-way evaluate it probably can happen because multi-way evaluate can have x equals x plus one. But but are the nest of the multi-way nest, is it carrying a time per iteration as part of the state specification? Probably not, actually. So you're probably right with an equivalence function, which is just uh, expression equivalence, it could have a closed time like curve. In other well, words, the 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 descendants of Brad could include a Brad. If that makes sense. Maybe, but I don't know how I appear in a nest graph or anything well, like that. Uh, forget forget you in particular. But okay. you know, the the uh, uh, what I'm saying is, if you imagine a genealogical tree, and yeah. there is a a um you know a friendly lizard who appears in the genealogical tree the the grand children of that lizard could be identical to the original lizard and so then in the genealogical tree you could choose to identify one lizard with its 10 step progeny or something or not yeah. as the case but, may be but i think these genealogical trees are built in an analogy with directed acyclic graphs whereas if if you have a nest graph even there's no guarantee that the output will be directed acyclic because of because of equivalences because of identifications well because you could you can just be searching this huge space and then you know you're way far out and you get a direction that says go back to the beginning but by beginning we, you could generate a new lizard so to speak the fact that you're going back to quotes the beginning yeah. is because you are implicitly identifying, you know, if, if you get the number 13, it's the same number 13 every time. Right. But yeah, so that's the option of keeping the extra time variable as you do the iteration. Right. Which is you... which we have in the multi-way graph, in the multi-way system code, we have this idea of you keep a unific unification index or not, as the case may be. Yeah. But I mean, this is the thing which I, I, I knew was going to be quite subtle, this whole question about how you slice these graphs up and when you identify things. And I mean, I think there's the, the question, and we already have this in, um, in multi-way system, is this state equivalence function, right? which is this question that you're now asking, if I understand correctly. Well, well what I'm really asking about is if the issue of having you know potentially infinite loops in the multi-way graph is it all related to renormalization theory that's what i really want to know about why would it be i mean it, it, you know i mean you mean that it's nested in some way yeah like let's say you're doing a computation on the multi-way graph and then all of a sudden you hit this loop that just keeps going on and on. You don't know where to terminate the loop. So is there some sort of renormalization theory that tells you where the termination should happen? This is multi-way always considered deterministic. Then whenever you have a loop, you just re just retracing your steps. You, you should always. Yeah. No, but I think what Brad is asking is what I was trying to get at earlier, which is there are certain patterns like a repeating infinite list where you can do reasoning about that that goes beyond just saying, oh, it's an infinite list with a generator. The, the, the renormalization group case is more the nested case. I don't think it's super relevant right now. I mean, I think it's a more sophisticated case. But, but let's come back again uh, I, I was just asking about that one because it's the one that seems like it would be the most relevant to physics for me. I don't, I, I'm skeptical, but we'll see. Um, okay. Let's go back again. Nick, can you go on with what you were? Okay. So this is, these are the, so replace lazy and evaluate lazy both go away, right? They don't exist. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Like, no. Okay. okay, so just make a note there that they don't exist and won't exist. What do you mean they won't exist? They're, they're not relevant. Exist. They're not functions we want to have, right? Why? Maybe okay, explain what they are. Uh, remember, we're only talking about visible oh, I mean, user functions. 
Okay, DNA right. Okay, so so note down that that is not a function. I don't want to see next week that we have you know replace lazy shows up as a function because we're not going to want to see that. Replace lazy has turned yeah, into. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. But, the, but make a note that that's what replace lazy becomes. Less lazy becomes this. Okay. All right. Fine. Okay. It is interesting that we've got these two terms, multiway and lazy, which have considerable overlap but aren't the same terms. I think we're going to have to address that later. Okay. Can you keep going? Because you were, you were going to show, I think, lazy subsets and things like that, right? Oh, you were actually going to show lazy find find re replace path. Yeah. So let's look at that now. Can, can we talk about it only in terms of the names of the functions that we intend to actually have? Right? Yeah, well, this is going to be much of a nest. Right. Okay, so just write it out. You don't have to change what you have there, but just don't don't change that line. Don't change that line because it won't run. Right? Oh, I'm not going to run it. <laughs> I'm just going to. Okay, okay. Because it's already already evaluated. Okay, and I was going. So this is it presents a result of a computation that can be continued. So you, the point of this is that you have, you have different methods that generate this kind of computation object. One of them is... And the wait, only wait, wait, wait. What, what's a lazy computation object? Wait a minute. That's, that's what we're now calling a multi-way object, correct? No, no, no. That, that's what we talked about last time, that we have a separate computation object that works with lazy data structures and multi-way objects like this, right? Okay, fine. All right. We okay. have like different methods. They find, they do different things. They search for one value or do some slices or whatever. So I don't understand. The things you were talking about before, where we, where we take a single part or something of something, why isn't that just a lazy computation? Why isn't that result just a lazy computation? What result again? The, the result when, when you were getting a single element, like the, you know, the millionth part of a lazy list of lazy lists or something. Why isn't that thing where we were previously, we were confused here. What kind of a thing is it when it is just an expression whose value is not known until you do a computation? Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, maybe okay. the same thing. It's, we, can, we can have like a three. I think it's the same thing. Mind. I think it's the same thing. Kristen, that's for you to make sure we, we follow up on that. Okay? Yeah, okay. Okay, so, yeah, might be the same. I don't like, yeah, anyway, okay. All right, so now find path. There's no lazy find path. It's just find path on a, right? All right, on the multi-way generating functions. Oh, it's not fine, but we already have fine. Wow. So we can't call it. No, no, why can't we call it fine path? But why, why isn't the G in there? What, what is it doing exactly? Well, this just searches for a particular value. Okay, but it, the path is going to be a proof of that value, basically. Correct. In yeah, in a sense. So it's well, actually, the full right. proof is not only the path, but it's not only the sequence of states reached, but the transitions used to get from one state to the next. Right. Well, the path the path is the transition. So you basically describe the turn where you go left and right in order to reach the value that you're looking for. Yeah, I know what you have to say. What, what I'm saying is the representation of that path, which is what we would do in the theorem prover, is, I think, is both what trans, you know, in the theorem prover, it is, you know, some substitution function where you take the lemma you're using applied to the lemma you're applying it to to produce a single result. And so here, I think what you want is one and then an arrow, and that arrow is labeled with some transformation F 
goes to one, let's say another, an arrow labeled with G goes to three, etc. cetera. Do you see what I'm saying? No, I, I've lost you. Okay. So we've got this multi-way computation object, okay? Okay. That is the result of multi-way nest. Am yes. I making sense so far? Yes, I did. Well, Something okay, else. but I can't tell what the heck that is. Is that a multi-way list? Is that, I'm sorry, is that a li list? Okay, if it had an actual wrapper that said multi-way object, I would understand what it was. All right. Okay, so let's. it's a multi-way object. Okay, so now what are we trying to return from the multi-way object? What we are in that multi-way object, we are trying to slice it in a variety of ways. Right? Yeah. Okay. Right. So one thing, can we write down what slicings, and, and perhaps perhaps Kristen has a list of these already. What things are we looking for? I think we made this list two or three times already. What things are we looking for in the multi-way object? Properties, basically. Yeah. No, it's not slices, it's properties. Okay, so, so I think these are the things which are essentially the functions that are in the multi-way system function. Okay, there are many, many different things. There are things like, you know, just like how many states do you get in a breadth first, you know, traversal would be an example of something. Yeah, there are many things, branch hill graphs. Yeah, you could just look it up in multi-way system. It's a big long list. Okay, so we have to- Oh, there's no count in there. Yes, there is a multi-way. Yes, there is. There's a way of just counting the number of in, in multi-way system because its default is to just go in the cosmological rest frame, so to speak, to just go, you know, or breadth first traversal. It can just count the number of independent elements at each level in the breadth first traversal, breadth first oh, okay. computation. Okay. Yeah. So we specify basically a number of levels. Yeah. Is yeah. It, right. But that's but that's not count a different sorry what you can count a different with different elements of order if you want right right but the point is the point is what we given the multi-way object right we have certain access or functions or properties that extract various useful things from that multi-way object well there's not much <laughs> you, you're saying that there's like a but there's um, tons of stuff. Go, pull up the pull up the multi-way system documentation from the function repository. Well, they're mostly related to like rules, events, right? They're not inherently like. Why don't you pull it up? I think it's longer a longer list than you think, because it's also. Okay. Okay, those are all what goes in. Okay, hold on. Back up, back up, back up, back up, back up. That sequential random and max scan. Those are relevant for ways to slice the multi-way object. See what I'm saying? Yes, sure. Let's say what you want to return from the multi-way object is a lazy list, for example, of slices, aka anti-chains. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the definition of what slices you're going to get will be determined by these things here, this event selection function thing. Will it not? In a sense, yeah, right, in a sense. Yep. Right, so that's, that's the impoverished domain-specific language for foliations for this in multi-way system, right? Right. Okay, so let's go, scroll down a bit here. It's just in general, there is no like general definition of event for- I, I, I know, I know. We're going to need that. We're going to need to define that, right? We haven't defined that yet. So let's look at things that don't depend on events. So there's things like states counts list. That was exactly the thing I was saying to you. It's a count of the number of independent elements at a particular level in the multi-way system or in the multi-way object. So for example, let's say there's a finite confluent computation. OK, 
Okay. After some number of steps, it's over. There's one result. See what I'm saying? So state's counts list goes, you know, 175, 2004, 10, 1 in that case or something. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that is a relevant and meaningful thing for the multi-way object, but it has to define the foliation in order to be extracted. Right? So for example, one thing you can ask is, in the multi-way object, what is the result? Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, but well, foliation, you want to describe foliation. No, 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 no. I'm saying in the case yes. where it is confluent and there is a single and a terminating confluent system with a normal form, then there is simply a result for the multi-way object. Right? Yeah. Okay, so that's one of the things we need to be able to extract. So in the case where there isn't simply a result, there could be some very stylized infinite computation, like a repeating infinite computation. Or it could be something where there's a lazy list of results that is a time-like lazy list of results, right? Right. Okay, the other thing that can happen is that there is a multi, there's a, there's, a, there's a lazy list of multis, right? Given a foliation, the, we can unroll the multi-way object into a lazy list of multis. Do you agree? Well, by multis, you mean the same multi-way object because it's essentially the same in this scenario. Is it the same multi-way object? So you think we don't need the multi-object that we've been talking about? Well, because it's like multi-way object that we've been generating here. with like nest, multi-way nest, multi-way replace. It takes a function initial condition or list of rules. And you can basically pick any position in the multi-way tree and just start generating from there. So as soon as you have a way to like generate an anti-chain, you just specify a list of initial conditions that you should generate from. There. I know, but I don't think we wanted a list of initial conditions. I think we want a multi to represent that collection of sort of multi-way slice, branchial space, you know, uh, initial conditions, right? Rather than just a list of initial conditions. That's what we discussed previous times. We discussed the idea that you unroll the multi-way object into a lazy list of multis. Is that making sense to other people here? What I'm saying? Ian, does that make sense to you? Brad? Yeah. Well, so, I mean, go ahead. Here. Like, for example, here we start from the initial condition, right? How is it different if you just have like some random deep number of other initial conditions like 50. Okay, because there's a difference between, yeah, okay, yeah. we were distinguishing the idea of a list, which is a spatial object, basically, in our definition of these things, from a multi, which is a branchial object. Do you see what I'm saying? Well, uh, well sure, but it doesn't stop you for specifying this branchial object to generate every... Next, next branch. Next no, branch. I'm, I'm saying, I'm saying, if you start with a multi, and then you run one of these things, a replacement, a function evaluation, etc. Right? You start with a multi, you run that some number of quote steps, whatever steps means, and you get out a multi. Am I making sense? It is a branchial object that is across multiple branches of history. Whereas you could also start with a list and get out a list, which will be a spatial object. And I think we're going to need to distinguish these. Well, it's not exactly clear. The, dif the difference is not clear yet. I agree. I agree. Maybe it's some kind of semantics, but not... Well, maybe it, maybe it isn't necessary. But, but, when I'm, but your statement that you get out that the multi-way slice is a multi-way object, multi object is definitely wrong, right? It's either a list or it's some new kind of construct that we're calling a multi. 
I don't know. It's like if this is if we calling this thing a multi, and it make a slice. In this case, it just no, no, no. It is a single slice. A multi is a single slice. It's not something for which you can make other slices. Now, it may be that the slice has to contain information on which slice it was, not just what it contains, not just what elements are in that slice, but also which slice it was. Do, do you get what I'm saying? Well, maybe it just contains a position of where we sliced it. That's not enough. So That's not enough. Position. It's not even close to enough. You've got a multi-way object, okay? And... Yeah. Deciding which anti-chain of all possible anti-chains you pick is not trivial. But it may be useful to contain the indexing of which anti-chain it was that gave you the list of values that you now got. So when you're picking an anti-chain, right? Mm -hmm. You're just picking the list of nodes in the graph if you just have a usual graph. Yes. So how is it different just Specifying the position of the each of those vertices and on all what the heck's the position in a graph? Well, because we are dealing not with the graphs but the actual multiway objects, we're not talking about any equivalents yet. We have a are you saying they're trees? Yeah, they're all trees. We have position of each of but those. it's not right. We won't want to represent them as trees. It's not the way that we are look. No, you no, know, you'll represent them as a graph with ordered ports. Right, which is which is a thing where it has had the equivalences applied. If we don't apply the equivalences, we'll never get anywhere. It'll be way too right. big. And if the ports are ordered, there's no problem with saying take the second one and then the third one, even if it's a DAG. Well, okay, okay, but but that I think requires some kind of token event graph thing. It's yet a different construct. I, I'm saying, given a multi-way object, right? What we need is that every one of those properties of multi-way systems should be extractable from the multi-way object. See what I'm saying? Um, well, I'm not disagreeing that it's impossible. Yeah, they can be extracted. Right, but then we need a clean can be extracted for this thing. Do so. I don't know what that thing is. It's just a tree. No. Yeah, but it's wrong to be a tree. It's got to merge its branches. Well, we, it doesn't matter whether it's actually explicitly merging it or not. It's when we have to traverse it, we can just not visit it the same node twice. And it's the same as- okay, I don't think that's going to work. I, I think that I think that the things that are cognitively useful to think of as reference frames will not work if we think of the whole thing as a tree. But think about the following case. Think about a grid graph, okay? Which has coordinates at every point. Well-defined, Euclidean style coordinates. Okay, now say I'm not going to assume that there's merging of these coordinates. Everything is going to be a tree. See what I'm saying? With exponentially many, you know, you're looking at the paths in the grid graph, not the grid graph itself. You're looking at every path, you're treeing out all the paths. It's not a very useful way to look at the grid graph. The coordinate system is much more useful than that treeing out of paths. But that's an emergent anyway. We can generate a graph and the coordinates from this tree representation, given an equivalence function. I know, but but it's not useful because the way that we're going to want to think about it in terms of reference frames is based on the grid graph representation, not on the tree representation. But so the, to say that in principle you can go from the tree to the grid graph is not very useful. Go ahead. But the representation is still an internal thing. It's like it's hidden from the user and from anyone who's working with it anyway. So we just have to hide it away. And I, I'm confused by that. But the, the basic bottom line is we you got to be able to get out a graph, right? So for example, one thing I should be able to ask from a multi-way object is show me the top of the multi-way object as a multi-way graph going down some number of levels. Now it's not a tree. Don't show me a tree. It's not a frigging tree. Well, then the it's not a tree. a tree. But then you just uh, equivalent so the not to get the graph. Okay, but but so okay, fine. I want to see a graph. I don't want to see the tree. Fine, it can be computed. It's just uh, I don't exactly understand how the graph is useful if you do the equivalence like from the start or in some way. 
It's like, I don't know. well, it's, what, it's what about timings? How long does it take to compute a whole tree? No, no, no. It, it, a tree is not a, is a non-starter, right? Because the, the you know all the things we've done and all the things we're studying in the physics project and all these different applications of multi computation, it's all about multi-ray graphs, not trees. But the computation itself is a tree-like thing. But it's not because the the branches merge. Otherwise, we right? But you don't do... know the branches merge until you do it. Yes, that's yeah. right. Once you do it, you can tell that the branches merge. So the data structure that emerges from actually doing it is a graph, like nest graph. I mean, nest graph could make a tree from it. In fact, nest tree does make, you know, we could we could write something. In fact, let's do this example, okay? Nest tree? Let's say, let's say nest tree of my favorite two hash, one plus hash. List two hash, one plus hash. I know, okay. Okay. Let's do that. Okay, there's a tree. Now let's do nest graph of the exact same thing. Okay. And you might want to say labels, you know, vertex labels goes to all automatic, whatever. Okay. The second one is doing less calculation. Obviously. Obviously. So I'm well, saying we're doing lazy computation. We don't we don't have to do them until we, it's really this is necessary. Right, but I, 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 what I keep on saying is one of the important properties of a multi-way object is to extract the finite multi-way graph as defined up to some slice in the foliation. Sure, it can be extracted without doing any necessary stuff. Okay, fine. From the lazy tree generator. That's basically maybe I, that's all. It's not a lazy tree generator. It's a, a multi-way nest. You can think of the multi-way nest you know, before equivalencing as generating a tree, right? Okay. Do you, do you agree? Multi-way yes. nest generates yes. a tree. If it doesn't do equivalencing, it generates a tree. Yep. Right? Right. Okay. Now, in actuality, there is an equ equivalencing that is being done. Right? Well, in what actuality? <laughs> well, in the case in the case that is a, a an actual application of multi-way nest, there's going to be equivalencing that's being done. James might want to jump into some of these things. I mean, in the actual case that we're going to look at for I don't know chemistry, or you know, or physics, or metamathematics. In all of those cases, there's lots of equivalencing that's being done. Right? I mean, Nick, you've worked on this stuff for. The right, the right, well, up to some, yeah, up to some multi, multi, which is actually kind of interesting in its own right because that's a path counting that actually includes the path counting in the multi way graph. Right. Which, by the way, is something we need to be able to do. If you label it, but, but path thing. counting is also easy to do after the fact. Okay, so they're very. So they, if if you say vertex label are automatic, you'll see the, the whole thing. Just to do vertex label. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Isn't that nice? Yeah. Great. Okay, so so just. To clarify again, I mean, what what did you just do there? By the way, you 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 equivalenced, yeah. You you turned it into a graph, and you equivalenced things that were that did not have the position. You ignored the position. You only right. looked at the payload. Right. Okay. So, I agree. This is right. But but okay. So I'm just saying. One of the things to extract is. Presumably something that should be called, I don't know, multi-way graph of the multi-way object, presumably. But the critical thing it. there. You can do it. Well, yes, but we need to actually write down explicitly what it is, right? I mean, we need to turn the, all those complicated options, you know, all those complicated accessors for multi-way system into a sober group collection of functions. I think I actually have like an actual property. I don't know what that thing is. 
What is that thing? What is it? Well, that's a lazy list of things. What should be just a simple. Okay, but what, what, how do we turn that into a data structure that we can use? Do you understand what I'm asking? Because we can't use this data structure. Right? We have a limited number of data structures we can use. Lazy list is one of them, but then that thing with, with arrows and so on, that's not what we can use. Well, it's supposed to be a lazy tree. list of edges. And lazy list of edges is essentially a graph. And you can generate this list of edges from multi nest generator. Lazily. Oh, yeah. Okay, I understand. But there's only a limited set of things we can use. So if we're going to have a lazy graph, which I think we are going to want, maybe this is it. A lazy graph is a graph with a lazy list of of, of uh, edges. Am I making yeah. sense? Right. Okay, so th then that, that is a definition of lazy graph. That's one of the representations of lazy graph. There might be other ones. But but would the lazy graph be a graph that's actually clickable on its nodes? Anyway, just a for formatting thing. It can be. It can be. We can do this, but it's not in not in not really soon. I'm sorry, what? Oh, you mean you mean actually clickable as in you can yeah, drill yeah. down to a you node. Can do the, now, that's something that is part of the the longer term roadmap for graphs. Yeah. But but again, okay, so what we're agreeing is that there is a third. There's lazy list, there's lazy tree, and there's lazy graph. Is that correct? Yes, well, maybe a lazy expression. Well, we don't think we're going there yet. You can prove that later. Right now we have lazy list, lazy tree, lazy graph. Right, so we're going to need functions like, okay, so again, again, what we need to do is, and this is Kristen, this is something I'm going to expect from you. Okay. You're going to make a list of the things that are in multi-way system. And for each one, we're going to figure out how we map that into functions that we are defining here. Does that make sense? Yes. Or, or properties we're defining for multi-way object. Okay. So for example, I would imagine we will have a branchial graph function, which can either take a, an explicit uh, DAG or it can take a lazy graph. Does that make sense? It makes sense up to, well, I don't know. It just generates, an, if you have a generator of anti-chains, then I think just branch of graph can be defined on top of that. Indeed. But, but uh, you, look, the point that we keep on making is we need this domain-specific language for representing anti-chains, right? We have pieces of that language. Ian has defined some with tree traversal order, right? We've had some of those defined in multi-way system. That's the thing I've been saying for weeks is a, is a key part of this, is making that domain-specific language for anti-chains, foliations, traver transversals, slices, whatever you call them. Am I making sense? Right, yeah. Okay. Just, we I have a guess, few. What? Go ahead. I just still think that it's just a the same multi-way object as here. It's the same object representing an anti-chain. So the the, the perhaps, object perhaps the perhaps it is. is the same as the for the anti okay. Well, perhaps it is. Then we don't need a multi, and we're going to call it multi-way object instead. But either way, we're going to need a thing that extracts a slice. You see what I'm saying? What that slice is, it might be a multi-way object, but we have to say which slice we want. Does that make sense? Sure. Okay, so Just the question is, how are we going to say which slice we want? Well, the most general is just, as I said, this is list of positions because it's a tree. You just have Except to... Except that that's, that's redundant, right? That's in the tree... There are many, let, let's say that the position 172 was included in the anti-chain specification. 
Okay, but the position 248 was not included in the anti-chain specification. Yet, those two positions have the same payload. Right, that's not a valid thing to do. No, it's uh, not a valid thing to just uh, assert that it's a some kind of anti-chain. But if you have a proper generator of those, you still get... No, I, I understand that. But I'm saying you can't just say use the tree indices to specify the anti-chain because that will the most anti-chains you specify by just giving a bag of tree indices will not be valid anti-chains. You see what I'm saying? Wow. So it's a bad idea to use tree indices to specify anti-chains because a set of measure zero of such things will actually be valid. I don't, well, you have, well, what is the actual definition? You, If you have a list of positions and the only constraint for it to be an anti-chain so that those positions shouldn't like be. Some There's no time like, uh, there's yeah. no time like connected positions. Yeah, basically. So the, right. there's no prefix. One position is not a prefix of another. So any list right. of such positions forms an anti-chain. Yes. But but the thing that we've kept on going over, I've kept on saying this, I've been saying this for months, right, is, and this is, I mean, you know, I don't know, the general relativity crowd, Jose, if he's, if he's paying attention here, would, would have things to say about this. Your average specification of a metric reference frame, whatever you want to call it, Right, it's just a total mess. If you pick one at random, it's just a total mess. The thing that what, what we want to do and what's going to be useful, and this is related to the whole observer theory idea, is there are a certain set of anti-chains, foliations, etc., that are reasonable observer slices to pick. Does that make sense? Well, again, it's you can pick one which is sense. And it does make sense only for the if you want to make a connection to physics. No, it's nothing to do with physics. It's it's true for basically every application of multi-way object. Same story. You want to do probabilistic programming, you want to do various kinds of distributed computing, it's going to be the same story every time. It's no good just picking random, you know random undefined elements where you don't even know which elements are going to exist until you run the computation. That's not what will work. You have to have a, an organized way to pick the, the, the elements that you want to be con considered to be the simultaneous elements of particular steps. Yeah, when you say simultaneous, I think it doesn't even make sense to just to say it about the elements of a multiway graph. Because you, it's, you, when you say simultaneous, you're already assuming a causal graph. So I don't think it doesn't make sense to foliate a multiway graph. And well, well but, it does, but it does. But it does. But 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 look at what you're doing. In the case, well, one issue yes, with yeah. foliating the multiway graphs is if you're only computing a partial graph. You don't know that whatever foliation you have on that partial graph is, ac is actually correct. I know that. I know that. But that's why I'm saying, yeah, right. I agree. I mean, in general, it's undecidable what things will live in a particular foliation. Because there could be a way, a path to get back to that element. Yeah. That's, you know, far in the future. I do want to talk about the causal graph case, but but I just want to come back to, I mean, again, we've made these lists before, and Kristen, I expect you to have this list next time of the use cases for multi-way objects, right? We, we talked about it before, finding an element, finding an element with certain properties, et cetera. Maybe you already have this. Right, that, but there's there's many many more properties. We already went through this at least three times, right? And okay, so but let's look at your path for a second, okay? You are given a particular object, a particular destination, and you are asked, "Show me a path that reaches that destination." 
Is that correct? Yeah, basically find it. Right. You traverse it. You are but, okay, but are you finding the shortest path that gets to that destination? No, it just finds it in whatever traverse order you specify. It. As soon as soon as it finds it, it just it stops. returns it. Okay, fine. So it's got a traversal yeah. order, which is you're saying for the purpose of this particular property of paths, the thing could be a tree. It would make no difference. Right? This particular property, it's the same mm -hmm. between a tree and a graph. Correct? The property of a path. No, 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 no. If your objective is to find a path, yeah. it doesn't matter whether the object that you are finding the path in is a graph or a tree. I right? guess. Right. Right, which is why you're looking at these things in terms of trees. But many properties that we want will care about whether it's a graph or a tree. For example, a property that depends on what's the probability to be in a particular region of branch hill space, basically. That's going to depend on it being a graph. You've got to have made the equivalences already, or you're not going to be able to answer that question. Right? But the, your particular you thing... You can reverse it as a tree. You just keep track of... Of the same element. Fine. But, but I mean, this path thing is a very fibrous kind of computation. It's just looking at a single fiber. You're trying to find a single fiber. Or maybe more than one. No, you're finding a that... single path. That's what find paths well, it's, it's doing. find paths here. No, 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 no. Let, let's be clear. What are you actually doing here? Is it find... Okay. Like find path, you might be able to give it multiple paths to find, right? Right. Okay, fine. But it is finding a limited set of paths. Not necessarily this, this shortest one. I don't know what the hell that is. Because I, whatever it is, we don't want it. This continue thing. It's, it's Look, you're finding a path. You're being given that constraint. I, I know, time constraint. I, know, I assume that's not a constraint in terms of time-like edges. That's a constraint in terms of number of uh -huh. seconds, right? Number of seconds. Sure. Okay. It's the it's the time like edges, but for the actual universe, not for the not for our model. Universe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. Okay. Well, we have a lazy computation, right? So it makes sense for whatever method it's using, whatever actual. But we don't have lazy computation. We have multi-way <laughs> object. We don't have that. We have. I thought we said we had. No, we say we have a single lazy computation object. Correct. We have multi-way object which is the result of the thing of multi-way nest, correct? Right, correct. Okay. Okay, so, so it's a multi-way computation. Why it doesn't make sense to continue your search in the multi-way graph, if you want? Maybe it does, but I'm not sure that's the right semantics. Okay, I would just find a path again. You, you cached the information, just find a path again. If that path didn't work going to 10 steps or something, try it to 20 steps. See what I'm saying? I, I It's not the right semantics. It's a procedural semantics that is not, I think, the right thing. But, but in any case, what you're saying is these functions can find one path or many paths, right? Yeah. It's just the way it's set up right now. It finds As soon as it finds the path, it stops. If it doesn't find, it just doesn't find it. But you can continue the search because it knows all the history and expands your lazy object. Okay, fine. But that, that's what it should do. But the way it should work is you say find path. What should it return? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I really profoundly do not like this continue thing. I think instead you should be re-asking for the path with kind of a larger search range. But what if you like, I have a traversed tree already and I want to change my traverse order, maybe even specify a new selection function if I want, right? You, you can yeah, make kind of continuation as arbitrary as you want. You can specify different parameters. Okay, then, then what you should be doing, and this is why I don't think lazy computation or computation object or multi-way computation or whatever it is is the output, you know, if that was itself just a multi-way object, then you could obviously feed it back in again to find path. 
Well, yeah, you can do the same thing here. You just continue is what is a no, 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 but we don't want that. We don't want it. We don't this want something that is a is a undefined continue where it doesn't even specify the traversal order. It's like it's like saying, you know, okay, okay. Let me just let's just understand what that semantics would be in other parts of the language if we were to have a thing called continue like that, right? Where would we use it? Well, the reason we don't use it is because essentially all of our computations run to completion. Do you see what I'm saying? Yep. Yep. Um, so that's why we never have a construct like this. Now, in the case of terminated evaluation, you know, x equals x plus one, it hits the recursion limit, it terminates the evaluation. We could imagine a continuation of a terminated evaluation. Do you see what I'm saying? Because it's a new yeah. semantic situation that we have where it's a frozen, unfinished evaluation. It's those yield proposals. Right. That, that would be great if we actually had something like this. Well, but... but... Okay, but we're not going to wag that. You know, this is like the micro, this is one hair on the tail of the dog is, you know, is this thing with the continuation of this lazy find path, right? That's one hair on the tail of the dog. We're not going to wag the whole dog with that one, one, you know, you know, one hair on the tail type thing, right? So if there is a con concept of a frozen computation, AKA a continuation or something that that can be restarted. That's a thing to think about, but that's a very global language thing. Anybody want to comment on that? I mean, why have we not needed that before? I think it's because it's an infinite evaluation system where everything runs to completion. Right? So we don't need something, you know, how would we freeze something? What we would do I guess, is we would say something that's, uh, I mean, it's your yield thing that says, here's a thing. And just, just to understand this for a second, Christopher, do you understand this? If you have a block of code and somewhere inside that block of code, you say, I'm freezing in, at runtime. You say this block of code out to this outer boundary is frozen. Now you we return. don't have any way to do that, though. No, I, I know we don't have any way to do that. But how would we imagine doing that? We would have a, a freeze zone. And within the freeze zone, if you hit at runtime something which says, now freeze the freeze zone, then we would have this thing that was frozen. It would be kind of like a hold from the inside. I mean, you could maybe have something like that if you had, if you were willing to basically manually localize all the variables in some way. Like you'd have a syntax a little bit like module where you basically tell it maybe in the first argument, here's the list of all the symbols that you need to basically resurrect when this thing gets resurrected. Um, do do yes. you understand what I mean? Yeah, and I that would be the outer wrapper. And then you have a yield on the inside. That could probably work. Right, but so then what would happen is it's going along evaluating this thing and then it freezes and it returns a frozen version of that thing with its variables sort of in place. And when you re-enter it, the problem is, how does the thing know that it's going to become alive again? Right? Because the thing it's returned is frozen. Well, well, no, I mean, I think that you, you, you have an object and you tell it, run until you hit yield. And it says, okay, you know, here's my new form now that I run until I hit the yield, and here's what I yielded. And then you take that new version of it, and then you ask it again, run until you hit yield, and, and so on. But where does it start running from? It's, it runs the whole thing. It starts running from the yield, ideally. Until it hits another yield. Yes. Let's think about that construct for a second. So you're saying the thing that comes back has inside it, it has values of variables. Don't we already have a construct that does this? Doesn't module effectively already do this? Um, we don't have 
because it stores the values of its variables, right, internally. If you return a module. Well, it stores them in a symbol table, but that might actually be okay. Um, no, yeah, okay, mo module, uh, I, I'd have to think about that. But I think the, the other issue is, is, is right. How do you, you know, if I tell you, here's a piece of code with a yield in the middle of it, you know, start evaluating from the yield, that's that's what we really don't have. Yeah, needs, that's right. That's yeah. what we don't have. Um, okay. Uh, all right. Let, let's, could, could we look at, I mean, we're making progress here, guys. It's just a bit, I'm just, my emphasis for Nick and Kristen is, please, let's, let's see the non-subterranean functions organized as we, you know, think that they might actually be used by people. Because that's what we need in order to be able to think about this more clearly. And again, we haven't solved the domain-specific language thing. This find path thing is is going to return a lazy list, I assume. Hell, I'm not sure. Okay, keep keep going. Show us the rest of this. No, this is the find path that you can continue it. This is you can ask the path if you search for fifty. You can just extract it by an actual work in a tree, right? Okay. What? What? Well, because compute lazy, the lazy object inside is a tree. So you can just use a part to actually extract the actual. Okay, stuff. this is not the right way to do this. Okay, what What are you actually trying to do here? You're, you're trying to say, look, there are two things you might want to, okay, this is what we, Remember when I wrote find replace path, which seems to have been submerged six times now, find replace path has multiple outputs that it can generate. Let's go back, Kristen, this is something for you. Go back and find the original find replace path that I did. It has at least three kinds of outputs. Okay, so one output is the sequence of states necessary to get to the thing you specified. Am I making sense? That's the, that's the, but it's just payloads and extract from I, I know I, I know I don't care I sorry I, I just we need to have it be a much cleaner thing than what you're giving here right and I don't think it's right to say there's just a bunch of random properties you extract I think we can do it in a more principled way but so so one thing is you are extracting the sequence of payloads in the tree slash graph does that make sense Another thing is you're extracting the tagged path graph effectively that says which transformation is made on each edge to get to the next, because you, you created this with a, uh, a multi-way nest, okay? Yeah. And that multi-way nest has essentially an index for each, Hello. you know, what's that? I just lost you for, for a second. Oh, the index, it has an index, which is the tree index that you are talking about here, right? Yeah. But it's okay. So that's another thing. So, so you know, another thing that you can get, which I had in find replace path, is the graph fragment. Right. I forget how exactly that works. That's much closer to what you get in the theorem proofing system. I'm a little bit confused by that. I, I think because the theorem proving system, remember, as we did in the in the mathematics effort, you know, the it, go ahead. It's, it's accumulative. Yeah. Right. And that we're going to want something like that here. And we're going to want the equivalent of a token event graph here. Because these things are all one goes to many. All all the things you defined, the multi-way nest, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, those are all good one goes to many. Are they not? Yeah, and the replace and the evaluation too. You just have to label each output that would essentially tag each event. No, but we, but we I don't understand. You know, token event graph, okay, has a pretty nice semantics. Token event graph has a set, which I might otherwise have called a multi. And yeah. what it does is it picks up some subset of that multi at every step, and that's an event. 
Oh, yeah, the, 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 yeah, tokenograph is completely different generator. Well, On I know, but so, uh, okay, so, so okay, okay, so let's go back to our list. Let's go back to our list because we're making a specific list of things here, right? So another generator might be a uh, essentially a token event graph generator. I think it's just a subset voice that you want, which would be a token replace or a tuple replace, right? Maybe. How many of these are we going to have? No. What does that mean? I mean, in... well, because we have already a subset replace, right? We uh, don't have tuple replace. What would tuple replace mean? Well, so that the, each element can be like be a part of the left hand side with some multiplicity basically you can use it multiple times so you probably replace i see but those are, that's an option right now that we have for token event graph right right now token event graph has the option can you reuse tokens right no i actually dropped that idea now it has just different kind of modes of operation, either it's a subset or tuple or other tuple. Okay. But I think what we want is something that is probably more like that. We don't want separate functions for those things. So it's more like a, a, um, uh, well, there's some function here, which, you know, which is the multi-input. I mean, I suspect we should have a function that is actually basically token event graph that makes graphs. Forget the multi-way case. Forget all of this that is the analog of nest graph where there's a, because in nest graph, there's a single element, a single graph node that is splits into multiple graph nodes on the next step. But token event graph, you can have multiple graph nodes that come together in an event to make new graph nodes. Right? right. Yes. And, and those can be just a part of a state. It's like in the token on graph, there is a implicit state that those tokens are extracted from. And they can be extracted in either in a subset mode or in a tuple mode. Yes, but, fair enough. Fair enough. And, That's fair. And it's not necessarily a list. It can be any kind of expression or tree. You just it's a, it would be a subset of positions and stuff, tuple positions, tuples of positions, and so on. Right, I understand that. But okay, so so we're going to need Kristen. We're going to need another function, right? Which is this this generalized token event graph, right? Which which is going to be which is another constructor of multi-way objects and also an immediate constructor because um, you see what's interesting is we have a nest graph, immediate constructor, which is like your multi-way nest, right? We don't have, oh, we do have a replace graph. Do we have a replace graph constructor? Replace graph? Okay. No, we don't have that as such, but we could have an explicit constructor. And by the way, multi-way evaluate, the explicit constructor is essentially trace graph, is it not? Right, so, so remember, nest graph is like the function version of, it's like multi-way nest. It's the, it's the eager multi-way nest. Or, a, a, you know, it's the eager multi-way nest extracting one particular property, namely a graph from the multi-way object that comes out. Does that make sense? Sure. So we need we need the analogous. So we, we're understanding that multi-way nest, eager version of it is nest graph. What is the eager version of multi-way replace? Well, it's kind of the same way, but you also iterate over each position and different pattern matchers for each rule instead of just applying a function and get yeah. multiple results yeah. Yeah. so it's a little bit it's a little bit more complicated so so we just remove that replace graph there we're just going to confuse us okay um 
So we don't have eager versions of multi-way replace, but we have the eager version of multi-way evaluate is trace graph, basically, I think. Ian, can you comment on that? I, I think it's multi versus single way, not eager versus lazy. Well, but this is returning a multi-way object, which is both lazy and multi-way. Mm -hmm. oh, it's confusing here. Okay. Although, yeah, it's, it's true. Like trace graph, like you run the evaluation to completion and show right. the whole thing. Right, and it's a graph in the same way that multi-way evaluate should be able to generate a graph. And the multi-way evaluate graph has a, has a time-like, space-like, and branch-like extent, does it not? Okay, can we scroll down? We're going to have to wrap up soon, but, but can we look at some of the other things you've done here? Since we, I think, only got to the very beginning of what you were talking about. You were okay. going to show lazy, what's that? Oh, Not lazy sure. tuples, yeah. lazy subsets. This is cool. Okay, so so let me just understand what lazy subsets does. So lazy oh. subsets of range of five would do what? Of range of, I think it just made for the lazy version at least. Right, but so I'm, I'm saying I'm saying lazy subsets of range of five. Yeah. That's those. Okay, but now just in front order. No, no, but but I'm saying lazy subsets of range of five, just like lazy subsets of range of a hundred, right? Yeah, I think oh, I'm not sure that you can do that. Okay, so so what you need to do, and that's what we discussed last time, was that lazy subsets of range of a hundred is a perfectly meaningful thing, right? We discussed that last time, right? Right. Because then what we want to be able to do is to iterate over that and do lazy style operations. So we want to find out the hundredth subset in lazy subsets of range of 100. Am I making sense? That doesn't work. <laughs> no, I'm sure it doesn't work. Oh, well, it depends on your actual implementation. Yeah, but I mean, it should work. Yeah. Right? It should work. That should be, so I think Ed Pegg, has a um, a thing in the function repository for subsets and various other things like this of an indexed version of that. That's very sad, Nick, what you just had to do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. In any case, hopefully this terminated evaluation will work better. Um. Okay, in any case, okay, so that, what, what are we saying here? So do you agree lazy subsets of an of a eager range of 100 should work? Yes, do you agree? Sure, of course. Sure. Okay, lazy subsets of lazy range, that should use something like Ed Pegg's technology for simply enumerating all possible subsets of all possible sizes, which I believe exists. Yeah, it's like something like subset form index. You can just iterate it over. It's actually what I use permutation variant of that for the lazy permutations. Okay, but it, cool. But tuples and subsets, I try to make like, something differently. But I could use the same thing. Just yeah, okay, fine. Because we, we, we have a canonical ordering from subset from index, and we should check that it's a sensible canonical ordering. I think tuples, but, I'm sure it kind of the same order okay all right okay now you were going to show something else i think as well about pattern matching yeah it's it's a little bit raw right now but i i think i made it work for some for a little bit it's like it's uh, i already showed the strict version at some point mm -hmm. it's the idea to have this intermediate thing i recently i called it just a substitution now I just call it match right it just a uh, some Complicated object, if you want to see that it's input form is some weird thing with some much sums and much products. It's some algebraic thing of a matching, right? Right. So this is representing, it's a pity Roman had to leave. This is representing the 
the set of matches which the pattern matcher could make. Right. Correct. Yeah, it and it's a lazy now. Now it represents a lazy relation because match sum now have a hold all attribute and it acts as a some kind of lazy data structure that you can iterate over. Okay, and but, but the the bottom line of the subject is that. Basically, there's a thing. That there needs to be some function. I don't know what it should be called. Replacements or something, which gives you the explicit, with respect to an expression, a rule. It tells you. Is that the right way to look at it? It tells you the collection of bindings that are possible. Is that right? Yeah, like this one. Like you, you take this match object, and then you extract bind bindings from this, and and this is gonna be a lazy list generator. One of those that just generates association of actual symbol bindings. In this case, then you can because it's lazy, you can just take a few of them if you want. Okay, so but but the function which we still don't have, let's take the function match bindings as an eager function independent of all of this. What it's okay. going to do is it's going to take. It's going to be like match queue, but it's going to say, what are the bindings of this to that? Is that correct? Match queue doesn't yeah. do that. Match queue mm -hmm. just says, does it match? In the eager case, it's actually a very simple function to write, right? You just use replace, you, you have an expression and it's some pattern, and then you just list a list of variables you use in the pattern here. Yeah, but then you have to use replace list, right? Because replace list yeah. gives you all possible ones of these. Yeah. And you make an association like out of those. Yeah, yeah, right, right. But so so what are we going to call that function? That's a good function, but what are we going to call it? Maybe there's already one in the repository. There well, there may be in the repository, but I don't think I don't know whether there is. But okay, but let's agree we're gonna have Kristen, this is again something for you. This is a function we're going to have, right? Is it called pattern bindings? Yeah, let's try it. Maybe it's. Yeah, yeah something like that. Okay. Huh? Did you run it? Oh. That doesn't seem right. Yeah, maybe it's not using a replace list. So I don't know. Right, but okay, but so, so it's a single way pattern bindings in that case. But there is a there should be a function that is the the general pattern bindings. Correct. Yeah, should be. Okay. And that's part of your, you know, eventually this pattern unification to be done on that, et cetera. But let's go back to what we had before. Okay. So then, because in the end, you know, when a replacement is done and there are multiple replacements that could be done, um, the, uh, um, I have to go in a second here, but but um, okay, but so what you have here is a lazy version of pattern bindings, right. where you could, which will feed into multi-way replace to be the thing that it extracts, right? Yeah, that that's what I have already for the. Strict version, some old version. Right? You can. I have a version for match queue replace list replace that using this intermediate object, and now right. I have a lazy one. Um. Okay, I'm gonna to have to disappear in just a second here, but I think we've made we're making good progress. And you know, for please, Kristen, ASAP, let's make 
the guide page. Let's make sure we actually have these, you know, the functions that are, because what I want to get to the point of being able to do is actually, you know, try and use these functions um, and essentially write code with these functions, if that makes sense. Yeah, for the next meeting, we'll have the functions implemented and the guide page ready. Are we good? Okay. Okay. Nick, you're, you're making good progress here. I mean, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I think you have the point of view that, well, as you said, you just implement a bunch of things, but I think we're now ready to kind of clean this up and, you know, tighten it up. Does that make sense to you? I mean, we're not completely ready because we don't know how to do these foliation specifications. That's the big challenge. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And and I think that challenge, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I think that challenge is going to look very like what it looks like in general relativity in places like that, where they're like named metrics and so on. I don't, I doubt we're going to have some way of saying, you know, parameterizing all possible reasonable frames, if that makes sense. Yeah. Actually working on some simple functions that actually uh, implementing some embedding for the DAG, especially coordination. Co co how, how did we call it? Coordinatization or directed acyclic graphs, basically. Oh, wow. Okay. Because, I mean, that's what we're talking about here. Yes, that is a, yes, if you can coordinate as a DAG. Have you, ta have you talked to Brad about this stuff? Does Brad know what you're doing? No, not yet. Well, I, I haven't actually implemented it. I just have a list of ideas. It's like what I have, two functions that I have to do. Okay. I mean, you're going to end up re recapitulating the ADM formalism of general relativity, I suspect. No, I don't think it's that. It's it's a very simple thing. So I can have to embed it in the given dimension. It's a, embedding a partial order in a given integer dimension thing. Okay. It's just, a, it's called, you just have to implement a multi-dimensional scaling that we already have. It's just, a, it's not working for the arbitrary distance graph distance matrix, right? Okay. So make a causal graph, make a distance matrix out of it and make a multi-dimensional scaling and you embed it in the any dimension that you want. I don't know why, why nobody still haven't done it. Okay, well, you should describe it another time. I mean, we've, okay, we got the foliation coordinatization business, we've got the causal graph business, um, and, uh, right, um, Okay, we've got to wrap up here. Thank you all very much, and uh, see you another time.